Hello, you are listening to the OmniTalk Fast Five, brought to you in partnership with Microsoft, the AM Consumer and Retail Group, Takeoff, and Suzzle. The OmniTalk Fast Five podcast is the podcast that we hope makes you feel a little smarter, but most importantly, a little happier each week, too. Today is June 16th. I am your host, Ann Mazinga. And I'm Chris Walton. And we are here once again to discuss all the top headlines making waves in the world of omni channel retailing. Chris. And the best news of this morning is that we survived our European tour. Um, we're back home in Minneapolis. Uh, how are you feeling this morning? Are you ready to rock this podcast? Uh, yeah, I'm a little worse for wear, Ed. I'm not going to lie. Five Sorry. five cities in 12 days. Yes. Three video demonstrations as yes. well that we recorded while we were out there. Yeah. Uh, we For those that don't remember, we were in London, Germany, by way of Cologne and Munich. Yep. And then we went to Amsterdam and Utrecht which is my new favorite city, Utrecht, Utrecht. not Utrecht. <laughs> that's, what you, that's what we thought it was. But it's, we were corrected no that the right pronunciation is Utrecht. Oh, so okay. Like, yeah. Say it again, Ann. Just, Utrecht. Yeah, good. You, it's good. For those watching on video, you'll Shoulder see that she got there. full body action into yeah. that too. But yeah, that's my new favorite city in, oh, in Europe. That place, was, that place I, was off the hook. Yeah, I love so it. many college students and young adults and thrift shops and, and like really and like cool, cool vibe yeah it was a culture. cool vibe yeah I no, it was like cool... college students it, no I, I, I thought it was like boulder had you know boulder and amsterdam had a kid yes. is what i would call yes. that which who wouldn't want that yeah you well know? it was amazing um thanks for all the support while we were out there we were at shop talk europe um that went off. yeah you crushed shop talk well. europe you too, too. oh thanks but no you did awesome you your panels were and your panels were tough like you yeah, had we had you some had, challenges you had a disassociated uh, group of people there in terms of who you had to kind of coalesce, but you did yeah. an awesome job. Yeah. All right. And well, before we get to the headlines, yes. we've got some exciting special guests for us today. Oh, we sure do. And this is always my favorite show of the month because we get to get the insights from the a and consumer and retail group. And today joining us is noted OmniTalk Fast Fiber, Chad Lusk and OmniTalk Fast Fiber first timer, True at Home. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey guys, good morning. Good hey, morning. good morning. Or afternoon. Does it do you even know what time <laughs> We're not zone really you're in sure right what now? time it is right now? It doesn't matter. Space yeah. and time doesn't matter right now. Chad, just retail news. That's all that is important today. Yes. That is. That's right. That's it's well said, and well said. Space time continuum means nothing to me right now. <laughs> Chad, true it. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Uh yeah, absolutely. So uh Chad Lusk, um, been with uh, Consumer and Retail Group here uh, for a little over a year and a half. Uh, former operator, multi-time chief strategy officer, chief marketing officer. Um, and I uh, predominantly worked at the intersection of, of CPG and retail with consumer-led growth marketing and commercial transformation. So Happy to be back with you guys. Uh, fifth time. Fifth time. I was going to ask you if you actually have been keeping records. Of course. Five yeah, times. Yes, indeed. So wow. I'm hoping for my jacket or special access to the exclusive cocktail lounge. What, yeah. Whatever Turns I get Turns out you just that. get a lanyard, Chad. Actually, That's it. I thought it was a free bowl of soup, man. I thought we'd give him a free bowl of soup <laughs> when we see him next in Chicago. <laughs> All right. True it. How about you? Hey, good morning. True at Horn. I'm a managing director in the CRG's Dallas office. Oh, cool. um, so I'm a Texan and been with CRG a year now. And most of my work revolves around commercial growth. So think uh, marketing effectiveness, um, go to market strategy, pricing, et cetera. Before joining a CRG group, I was at JCPenney for three years, leading oh. the marketing team and, and uh, also led the, the strategy team. Proud of that um, was at a, another consulting firm. So great to be a part of, of this and really excited to be on here today. That's awesome. And that's why we love having you guys on the show too, because everyone at AM, a, AMCRG usually has a uh, as an operator background too, yes. which both of you guys clearly have. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking about this week's headlines. And and this week's headlines are not short of interest to no. me. I thought these were some great headlines. All right. But first we are going to do what we always do. And that is to say a big thank you to our listeners. Number one, because, Anne, we reached number three on the right. Apple podcast ranking Top this past three. week. We're in bro we have a bronze ranking right now. We do. A bronze ranking. Yes. But we want gold, Anne. Yes. We want to strive for Go gold. For Actually, gold. I don't want gold, Anne. I want platinum or diamond. You're platinum now on Delta Sky, too. That's pretty sweet. All right. But we wouldn't be there without all the great reviews you guys are leaving for us each and every yes. week. And as we do each and every week, we're going to read one of those to you today. And this, quite honestly maybe one of my all-time favorites. It comes from someone that calls himself 
him or herself, excuse me, astronomy newbie. That's kind of a new twist for the naming. Too, I man. know. Yeah. I know. Now I feel like we need to add some sort of like astronomical like component to our show. Maybe yeah, I'll just we'll call you our sign. I'll call you something. Pisces for the rest of the day, even I'm though you're not a I'm Pisces. A Scorpio. You're a Scorp- Ooh, Scorpio. Scorpio. Yeah. All right. I'm going to call you that. I might call you. No that. one's going to be surprised. All right. Yeah, no. Right. All right. But they gave us five stars and here's what astronomy newbie which we got to get the backstory on that had to say ah the good old days feels like it was just yesterday alas it was actually 20 years ago that chris was my boss at gap few of us are fortunate enough to kick off our careers with that kind of mentorship that teeters somewhere between genius and (laughs) that shit crazy even fewer are fortunate enough to get a weekly dose of those amazing days back in the form of a podcast and is brilliant and the two of them have made my weekly trip down memory lane more than just entertaining nostalgia. They educate and inspire, and I'm grateful for it. I do think they need some sort of uncensored format, though. <laughs> Chris's rants back then were legendary works of art. And by the way, for those listening, and and I have no idea who this is. Well, they know I, you well, though. Yeah, I have no idea who it is. Like, they haven't come clean. I have no idea who it is. Like, I, I've been scratching my head to try to figure it out. But uh, thank you so much, whoever it is. Um, that actually, that note actually meant a ton to me too. The way that was written, I thought it was brilliant in how it was done, and also it was very, very nice and oh very gosh. kind. So thank you for that. We need to work that. on the uncensored, the the after dark, the Omni Talk after dark series. <laughs> I don't know if she's saying that. I think she's just. Saying, she's oh, saying, not that way. No, I mean like the after dark, like the the like post the raw show, the raw version, uncensored. right? Yeah, right. Yes, okay. yes, <laughs> yes. I I guess yeah. I wasn't going the Build a Bear route with that one. The Build a Bear After Dark series is not happening. All right. Anyway. The point of what I'm trying to say is if you can, please make sure that you review. If you're listening, it means a lot to us. You can leave a review on Apple podcasts, heart the podcast. If you're on Spotify, Google, Amazon music, you know, the drill, but please follow and subscribe so that we can keep making the best content possible for all of you. And we may just read your review aloud, just like astronomy newbies for all our listeners to hear, but Chris it's time. Yeah. And let's get cozy as fluff with Chad and true it on today's fast five headlines. All right. Today we've, got news on target expecting a further profit squeeze from unwanted inventory the biggest mall owner hoping to create a new sales holiday sam's club ending free curbside pickup for most of its members amazon prime preparing for drone deliveries and first we take off with news out of walmart and that is right chris according to cnbc walmart will open four new fulfillment centers over the next three years that the company says will let it pack and ship orders in one day or two days. Um, And the first one will open this summer in Joliet, Illinois, about 40 miles southwest of Chicago. So instead of employees, I found this note really interesting. Instead of employees walking an average of nine miles a day, that's the average for those warehouse employees that are manually packing and picking orders. They will have new automated systems that will retrieve items from expanded storage space and then shuttle it to the area where an employee will pack and pick or pack the box. And it will be custom made to fit the order. Yeah, that that was super cool. Yeah, Yeah, I like that part. Um, Chad, we're going to go to you first on this one. Give us your thoughts on cutting the travel time from nine miles down to seemingly one maybe i don't know a few blocks zero zero, no more five k's happening so that's uh just to get orders packed and picked first one's in your neck of the woods too i believe chad joliet illinois yeah joliet not too not too far away from where i am in the chicago area i mean i giddy up like like that number was astounding right Mm -hmm. like it was crazy um yeah i mean you know listen online's rising walmart obviously has the scale and in a margin pressured steady state environment that we have, right? Let alone nowadays with inflation, like retailers need to continually look for ways to address costs. Fulfillment's a huge cost center. And we're finding more and more retailers doing that with micro fulfillment centers. Um, It's a way to operationalize both the omni-channel shopping experience as well as address these margin pressures. So Kroger and Akato, Wakefern, and you know, another one of your sponsors take off. Um, so yeah, get, get Walmart on board. You know, a little kind of side anecdote here. So a team of A&M CRG uh, consultants recently visited at an auto store uh, MFC recently. So okay. Ajo Del Hayes is beginning yeah. to incorporate these guys. Um, so we've seen this kind of automated micro fulfillment on the grounds happening. Uh, actually, we just published a paper on it last week, which uh, quick plug, loyal listener. You can find both on our website as well as the OmniTalk blog site and our yes, CRG repository. So uh, I'm a company man. 
Um, <laughs> but listen, lots of great facts in there. And you can see why Walmart's going this path and others. Um, you know, at, we found out in this, in this visit for grocery items, you're talking about operating over 430% faster than mm -hmm. manual picking right. and reducing the cost of omnichannel orders by seven to 10 bucks per grocery order on average, like it's huge. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna afford the capital outlay, which Walmart clearly can, then, you know, make it happen. Um, so, you know, for everyone else, decision's not as easy, um, but, you know, if you cement your omni-channel strategy and, you know, are prepared to make the investments, it makes sense. And I think we'll see more of it. Yeah, those are great Go stats ahead, to pull too, Chad. I think that's really important for people to understand. So check out that uh, review that AM did because there it's it's important to understand just how this works. So I think a lot of people are still pushing this off, like Chad's saying, because of the upfront investment. And it's not, you know, it, it makes sense in the long run. When you start to see numbers and changes like what Chad outlined earlier, like that's that's huge for going in all in on, on one of these centers. Yeah. And the other thing I'd add to just as a point of clarification, these are the big centers, right? These are the right. big automated centers that you know are a little separate from the micro fulfillment discussion. But I think it's an important angle to the discussion. I'm glad Chad you brought it up. I was actually gonna ask you about the reports. So I'm glad you guys did. Um is you know something I learned at Shop Talk, which I'd never thought about. And mm -hmm. um Tim Steiner at Avocado, who Chad also mentioned. Uh, open the show. Yeah. And he made a really good point. And I talked about it in some of our live streams too, that, you know, he said the aha for them, because they always kind of shun the micro fulfillment center, but the aha for them was that actually the, the large scale micro fulfillment center, similar to what they're doing with Kroger with then going to the smaller centers mm -hmm. is actually a necessary precursor in his mind to get the efficiencies in the smaller centers yeah. later. Right. Um, which I think is a really interesting point. And if, if that's how Walmart's thinking of this as step one, a to then step one B, mm -hmm. I think it's brilliant. And because, you know, they've said they're going to do the micro fulfillment, but for some reason they've been slow. Maybe this is the reason why. Right. And if that's the case, I think that's that's a really important angle here. Um, and the technology is super cool. Like Canops, like Canops a part of this technology. I think the, 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 the piece about, you know, fitting the box to the actual order is huge when you think about sustainability, which is also mm -hmm. a theme out of Shop Talk. But but true. You got anything to add here? First timer. I think Chad well covered it. I mean, the only thing is, I think, um, I mean, obviously Walmart really pushes for innovative innovation and in, in logistics and keeping Amazon in mind um, as uh, obviously as kind of their North Star in terms of how to stay competitive. And so you'll likely see more of this. Uh, I think Amazon is another topic, which is interesting that we have both on the, on the uh, docket today, but um, I would just expect more of this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, seems like it seems like a good move. Yeah, it seems like resolutely we applaud Walmart, which is not a typical thing we've done on this show of late. So that's right. good. But what can definitely one of the themes of Shop Talk Europe that you mentioned, Chris. I mean, there are it wasn't just Ocado there. It's I, you know, most of the retailers, especially grocery retailers in Europe who are starting to really dive deep into this. It was one of the key themes coming out of that conference. Um, especially when you start to look at how those trends make trickle down and, and make their way into the U S. So I think kudos here to Walmart, as you said, absolutely. All right. And let's keep on rolling. So again, for headline number two, according to CNBC, who is much in the headlines this week, nice reporting from them. Target said it will take a short-term hit to profits as it cancels orders and marks down unwanted merchandise. Target CEO Brian Cornell said the big box retailer wants to clear room for the merchandise that it wants to sell, like groceries and back to school supplies. And Target anticipates that its operating margin rate for the second quarter will be around 2%, which is lower than the outlook it gave less than three weeks ago, which the timing is important on this story. The company also reiterated its forecast for sales growth and said margins will look healthier in the back half of the year. True it. We let you off easy on that first one. Uh, what's your take on on this story? What do you what does this say about Target or maybe even the state of retail more broadly? Yeah, I mean, to me, I think it's a story of state of retail more broadly. Um, you do there's been a incredible amount of news in terms of the souring consumer sentiment, right? Multi multi decade low um, inflation, multi decade high, and um, and you know savings that were built up through stimulus rapidly burning through with, with uh, consumers. And so um, it's been interesting just to see the inventory builds across retailers that they reported, right? And, and almost to a retailer, there's something 40 plus percent build year over year and flat is to negative sales. And so I think it's a challenge that everyone is facing in terms of uh, too much of the wrong stuff. I think Target is very differentiated in terms of 
being willing to take their medicine. And so, you know, obviously mm -hmm. coming out three weeks after a report, cutting your, your uh, operating uh, margins, uh, you know, more than half is not something that anyone aspires to do. But if you're going to do it and want to well position yourself, I think there's something really encouraging about the decisiveness here. Um, and if you, you know, say what you will about Brian Cornell, if he has a lot of conviction and once he decides on something, it, it appears they, you know, they at Target do move on it. And so I think the, the strategy is right from a standpoint of cleaning through the inventory and, and trying to get position cool. I don't think you'll see many others do it because um, whether it's the wherewithal financially or the credibility publicly, I think folks will try to just manage uh, manage through this and not take the impact to rate. Uh, and frankly, longer term, I think that'll be to the detriment to the year. Um, but so I think it's very difficult. Control. So, okay, you know, here. you'll just keep, you know, I would say not take the markdowns as, as, fast as you can to try to manage, you know, manage through that and frankly hope that uh, there's other methods, whether that's pack and hold, whether that's the consumer does return to some of these categories. Mm -hmm. I just don't think there's any leading indicators that would state that's going to be effective. Um, and so I think it's gonna be a challenging year, uh, you know, and as you all know, buying cycles have already happened nine plus months. So these mm -hmm. aren't things that are easily solvable. So I just think it'll be a really challenging year for retail um, uh, on the earning side and, um, and, you know, frankly, just, in, it's another reset here. <laughs> yeah. that the part about why target came out so soon relative to other retailers with this, I think that's interesting. I want to double click into that more particular, sure. but, and what do you, what do you think? Well, I, I initially read this and I, you and I were together when we read this headline yeah. and I have to give you some credit here because this, when these earnings first came out three weeks ago, you were like inventory, they have a huge inventory problem. This is going to be an issue. And sure I will take enough, credit for that actually. And sure enough, a few weeks later, here we are. And I, I think it's interesting what Truett said though, like how they, they're willing to take their medicine. I think it did take a lot of courage for them to come out and say this and take this approach, but 15 billion dollars in excess inventory that is extraordinary and so i guess yeah. my question is like what does target do what what do other retailers that true mentioned what does target do and how much is this going to pack impact some of the other initiatives because storing all of that inventory is not cheap yeah and that's why i want to get that's why i want to that's why i want to double click into this on on why target i think you bring up a good point too which is like is you know, Target is in a unique position here because of their back to college and their back to school business. And so that makes me think, one, they almost had to do it to clear the space for that yeah, stuff, right? Which like is essentially it. what they're saying. Yeah. But then the truth, you brought up another point too, which got me thinking as well, like, yeah, you're buying that stuff nine months ago. So where, where and when did you recognize this de decrease in demand? And are you going to have the same problem here as you go into back to school, back to college again, mm -hmm. too, because you overbought to that level as well? Or how are you thinking about that? So, so yeah, I'm curious what you guys, what what both of you from a and then am side think about that because it's a really interesting question when you start asking yourself like, how do we get here to begin with? Why did why did retailers in general believe their sales forecasts were going to be so high to validate these levels of inventory, or was it something fundamental to the supply chain and how it was operating? What's your take? yeah? I mean, I'll I'll share a little bit more and obviously Chad jump in here. I mean, I think it's a few things. I think one is even the, the best institutions with the best customer insights miss this, right? I mean, I think that's very clear in terms of how rapid the change in customer behavior was gonna happen. Um, and, and you've seen all the pandemic winners suffering right now as there's been a, a complete reversal of any of those behaviors. I think the, the second is um, the odd uh, negative impact of having the supply chain prowess that Target had in terms of bringing goods in faster, mm -hmm. uh, provide less you know, latitude to cancel orders, to readjust on the factory side, all those types of things, right? Given that they chartered their boats and had everything kind of in time, that's actually negatively impacting them. I think the third is, it is a good question, right? Back to school. So what does that mean? And, um, you know, on one hand, you could argue, well, the the first purchases that families make are always for their children right whether that be you know basic necessities or food etc or clothes right? right so that's that's you know likely going to happen but at the same time 
with inflation at nine, you know, hovering around nine, that anything is kind of on the table. So you'd have to expect it to have some impact of behavior. And the calculus that Target must have made is our probabilities are a lot better in back to school clothing than it is in TVs and, and swimwear and other things that we just totally messed on, right? Mm-hmm. Outdoor yeah. furniture, et cetera. But mm-hmm. yeah, obviously, Chad, point. what's your thoughts as well? Good point. Yeah, Chad, why don't you get the final word here? Yeah, I mean, true, it's got a phenomenal perspective having lived this at, uh, at, at JCPenney. You know, my, my analogy and reference is a, is a little simpler. And uh, so being oh, a, great. A, a, big, a big Seinfeld fan, I, I couldn't help like hearken back to this like Seinfeld skit where he talks about going to the store and wondering if you have any milk, right? Because the worst thing is to be without milk. So you get it, you buy it, you go home, you see it in your fridge, and now you have way too much milk. So you're inviting all the neighborhood cats over to drink it. You're washing your face in it, right? Like you can't be left without certain, you know, inventory levels for key events. And I think the why target element is interesting. So if you compare it to, you know, Walmart, which is a little bit more basic goods, right? And just seeing the big swings in certain categories for target being a little bit more fashion oriented, they're probably a little bit more privy to it. I mean, everyone is feeling the influences, right? The combination of pandemic inspired consumer preferences and surging demand, then you have the deep supply chain bottlenecks and the risk of not fulfilling those needs fast enough. So you overcompensate with inventory. It's too late. Demand is stabilized. You're left holding it like it's classic bullwhip effect, right? But but for me, you know, the, the question is, and you guys are pushing on the right things, is this just everything worked against Target and these other retailers because of these anomaly events? Right. Or, you know, are we actually seeing something that's going to be more episodic versus one time? Right. Like, could it be that retailers demand signals are not as well honed and predictable as they used to be? And and it's probably not or and supply chains are built to those more predictable patterns that we'll never see again. Mm -hmm. Right. Like pandemic was a once in a lifetime event of consumer buying behavior. And then two years later, it's once in a generation historic inflationary environment. That's again, creating big shifts in discretionary categories. Like, is that it? Are we done? Like, or will the next storm come and is target and others prepared to weather it? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I love that point, Chad. I think that's a great perspective on just how flexible we need to be. Yeah. And the one thing I'll say too, that I, I got to have to call it out the point about clearing through the inventory to make room for groceries is total baloney now that I'm thinking about it. And I hadn't thought about that until just now, the supply chains are different. The storage space is different. Like the only way it would impact you is if your back rooms in the stores are so overrun by product, you can't even take those orders. Right. But, but to use that as the rationale here is kind of hooey. I'm just going to call it like it is. Cause that's what we do on this show. But I didn't think about that until Chad just used the Seinfeld milk analogy too. Like, It's just, that's not what's going on here. So it makes me do wonder though, again, like how big is this issue down the road? But we'll find out. Well, maybe they could try doing what uh, Simon Properties is about to do and make their own holiday to get get rid of some of that inventory. (laughs) Uh, So headline number three, once again, according to CNBC, a three-timer this week, Mm -hmm. uh, David Simon, the chief executive officer of the biggest shopping mall owner in the country is creating his own shopping holiday the event is called the national outlet shopping day chris Ooh, just rolls off the tongue uh, and by simon property group and it is meant for people seeking out deep discounts david simon said uh think amazon prime day but for retail outlet centers oh i am he's really gonna oh, give himself he's gonna hold himself yep. at the same level as amazon uh, the first iteration runs this weekend at the real estate owners 90 premium outlet and Mills branded outlet properties in the U.S. Uh, True, we're going to go uh, to you first on this one. Um, are you getting packed up? You're going to get the family over to the outlet center this week for the, the biggest national retail holiday of the year? So believe it or not, I was actually in an outlet mall during this, during this event. So had a little bit of an on the ground perspective. Um, and I would, you know, kind of to summarize, I think it's a for effort. Um, I think the results are, you know, not results to be determined in terms of what this actually does. Um, look right now, I mean, everything is about value for the customer. So if you look at marketing and look what everyone is saying, 
Um, it's deals, it's lowest price, it's a lot of pivot into value given what customers are facing. Um, the outlet mall should benefit from that. And um, I think admittedly, there was about a third of the retailers that participated as okay. David would have wanted on this. Um, the anecdote is the malls were busy. I think it was about kind of what it you know, normally is on a weekend. And the, the you know, the question I have is, um, you know, the malls are, are creating this event, but a lot of the retailers, because many of these are, um, these properties are, are anchored actually by, you know, it's outlet and off price. Mm -hmm. And as I was just going through the deals, none of the off price played. And so really the deals were around, um, some of the outlet and then i would say the discretionary stuff right like the food players and the malls were playing those types of things so i think for that to be fully impactful you really need everyone to jump in right versus just um uh free riding <laughs> from yeah. that standpoint mm -hmm. and until a tj maxx or burlington or a ross is going to say okay we'll actually do something different from our promotional strategy which uh, to my knowledge, they haven't ever done, right. then um, I just don't see this reaching its full effect. Yeah, <laughs> I tend to agree with you. Yeah, yeah no, I, we were, Ann and I were talking about this before the show. I, I kind of feel the same way you do. And I'll take it a little bit further too. I, I actually think it's kind of unimaginative, you know, and I would actually argue that Simon of all the mall operators has been, has kind of read that way for me over the yeah. last couple of years. Like, you know, some of the things they're doing with like buying up old brands and thinking that's going to help them and all that kind of stuff, which doesn't make sense to me. And this is just more of the same. It's like a it copycat it e strategy. It makes it easier to do these kinds of promotions if you own all the brands yeah. in the outlet center. I, though, Chris. I <laughs> guess. Yeah, right. But I don't know that that's an anchor or an albatross I want to put around my neck. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, and, and even the way I made a fun of it, but the way you read the tagline, it's like it doesn't roll off the tongue. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything to anyone nationally. True. Its point is dead right, too. If you don't get the retailers to play into it. What good is it? And and you can't fund that yourself as the mall to be like, here's 20% off every operator in our mall, every retailer in our malls. It's just too damn expensive. So like, this just doesn't have a lot of teeth to me. It lacks imagination, but I, I don't know. Maybe we've convinced you at this point because no. I, I was you were kind of holding court against me earlier. I'm seeing curious yeah, what you think. I still think, I still think I'm going to hold to Truett's earlier point, which is a forever. I think yeah, you have right. to start right. somewhere and they that. are trying to create a unified holiday or experience now do they ha have they executed it correctly the first time no but yeah. very few people do and right. so while i think that they were very ambitious in the in the title of this and comparing yeah. themselves to the next prime day especially when especially when you're only doing the outlet centers like this is not full mall this is just right. outlet right. centers which is key to call right. out and so i think that it's it, it's a test that they're starting right. in their smaller centers, only 90. And then we may start to see fingers crossed that they learned a lot of things from this yeah. all to the points that you and Truett bring up. And then how do they really use their leverage as the biggest mall owner in the country to start doing more coordinated efforts that hopefully will snowball into other coordinated efforts at yeah. where the mall is acting as the landlord, you know, this landlord, yeah. this marketplace type of thinking versus yeah i guess i, I guess if, i guess if i'm glass half full and not glass half empty coming off a nine hour flight from amsterdam yesterday i think i could see what you're saying and like yeah maybe it's just a good first step for them to try to brand themselves nationally like maybe it points some holes in that strategy like we're talking about and maybe they improve over time but chad, Ch chad you're the marketer here yeah and and you're the tiebreaker as far as everybody's concerned on this so where are you gonna fall no pressure. Um, yeah, no, no pressure. Uh, well, I think David Simon should get together with Hallmark because they're really good at creating holidays sort of out of, uh, <laughs> out of thin air, right? <clears throat> um, so, I mean, I, 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 I agree with a lot of your points. I mean, so, um, you know, I guess just fundamentally in terms of like where value-based retail sits in this kind of environment. So actually, friend of the show and A&M CRG partner, Dave Ritter, uh, recently commented on a piece in, in Retail Brew among the kind of retail winners and losers amid rising inflation. And so, you know, Dave's overall point in that was that these value-oriented players show more resilience during high inflationary periods because they're really more set up in ways that preserve their business models, right? And so I'm 
I'm, I'm not surprised in a way as true was explaining that, you know, a lot of these folks didn't really kind of latch on to deeper, you know, discounts and all like it's already part of the way that they operate. They're about mm-hmm. value. It's mm-hmm. resonating today. It makes sense. You inherently already kind of have that tailwind, uh, you know, as far as what Simon's creating here, right? Like it's an awareness building marketing campaign like that. You know, that's all it is, right? He's saying we're here. We presumably have full shelves, right? Maybe the stuff the retailers are trying to unload. Right. Mm-hmm. It's a great point. Um, we understand times are tough. We're here to give you a great product, a great value. Like, remember the outlet. So, you know, I don't see it as a one day outlet extravaganza being the next Prime Day or Singles Day or Black Friday, right? Like, it's a campaign to reacquaint the pinched consumer with a new yeah. or renewed uh, shopping option. And, and that's okay and good for trying. Uh, no, I, that that's well said. Well said. All right, well, let's move on to headline number four and to borrow Chad's and I pinch me and call me Shirley Ann because this this next headline, I don't know what to make of this. And I'm going to use this conversation, I think, to kind of formulate my thoughts a little bit on this one. But according to Business Insider, so not CNBC, but Business Insider, beginning on June 28th, Sam's Club will end free curbside pickup for most of its members. Sam's Club Plus or Business card members will still enjoy the perk as part of their annual $100 membership, but regular Sam's Club members will now be charged $4 per order pickup. Loyal um, Loyal Omni Talk fans will also know that a regular Sam's Club membership costs $45. So that is a $55 delta between the two. Truett, I'm curious, do you like this move from Sam's Club? And do you think we'll see others follow suit? So I don't quite understand this one. Um, really? And okay. the reason I don't understand it is, uh, you know, if, if you think about click and collect, and I think I was, you were just reading through, you know, Walmart has such a large, has built such a large business from that. I think 25% of total click and collect orders are, are through Walmart um, and across their banners. The, this is no longer something that was to test out, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it, it was initially communicated. It was, we're going to do it for a limited time um, for all, all customers and then we'll go to plus, but that's been happening for a couple of years. At this point, it's just embedded customer behavior. So you're increasing customer friction. They are essentially the only retailer that's doing this to charge for pickup. Yeah. Um, so they're carving their own path. And, you know, there are some pandemic behaviors that we have to admit likely won't change. And I think the convenience of, of curbside pickup is, is one of those. And, um, and if you think about their main competitors, I mean, Target naturally goes the complete opposite of this. They're doubling down as much as they can and adding value to the pickup experience, whether that's Starbucks or the infrastructure they have. I mean, go to you know a few Targets and see what they're doing in the parking lot. It's building more and more um, and really trying to to make it a great experience. So um, from a customer friction standpoint, it'll be very clear and obvious. And, um, you know, I guess the the math would have to be what type of migration you would have to the plus program. But in my experience, doing that through customer friction isn't usually a super sustainable mm-hmm. path. It's really um, and so, so you, I'm not great. <laughs> excited yeah, so you're not loving this. So you as a consultant, you'd be, you kind of would recommend them probably not pursue this approach if I'm hearing you right. Yeah. And I, I mean, it obviously depends on the intent, but um, I, you know, the economic, it seems like one of those, the economics on paper um, would probably be more beneficial than what you'll see in reality. Wow. And, um, and I, I just, it, it falls a little bit in the move of, um, try to be a little too cute with the program. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. All right, Chad, I got, Chad, I got to bring you in on this one. So do you, are you agreeing with your colleague here or how do you think about this? Uh, so first of all, I, I appreciate you saying the date. So June 28th is actually my uh, 20th wedding anniversary. So now I know I have to get all of my curbside anniversary gift items from Sam's ahead of that. Oh, I that. thought you were going to so say gotta... you're going to get your wife a business membership to Sam's Club. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey. Good luck with that one, Chad. That's 50 bucks, honey. <laughs> I hope the couch is warm because there that's you go. where you'll be. Um, you know, I, 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 Truett answered from a consumer perspective, which is typically the angle I like to take. So I'll, I'll answer from a business driver perspective and the point on economically how this looks on paper versus reality is a really good one, but but a slight slant, right? So um, 
I, I understand why they're doing it kind of with caveats. It feels like obviously a course correction, right? Pandemic comes, online orders spike. Um, those are more expensive to fulfill, lower margin. So you think, how do I urge my customers to still satisfy their need for speedy, uh, the most important thing at the time, safe delivery, but at a lower cost to us as the retailer. So you introduce free curbside pickup. Sam's rolled it out in June of 2020, right? Think of what was happening in the world then. So that was the big trade-off shift right. from online to curbside. Well, now that in-store shopping is mm -hmm. meaningfully back, shoot, free curbside doesn't look as hot as an option anymore. Mm -hmm. So I always say happiness is a function of what you compare yourself to. And when you compare the cost of curbside fulfillment to regular old in-store purchases, yep, you're time. not as happy. So Especially so at a get, club store too, right? Like a club 100%. store dynamics are different than Target and Walmart. Yes. 100%. So I get the economic drivers. And so they will be successful, if that's the goal, in reducing curbside pickup orders. Question is, where does that shift go? Um, does it go back in store? Does it go to online and delivery? Does it go to Sam's Plus, which I guess would be their ideal state, but, you know, don't know. Um, at least, and this is where I think it's, you know, okay to test this. I don't think it's likely going to Costco because they never took curbside pickup seriously, which right. maybe you can't argue as vigorously now. Yeah. And so maybe there's not the competitive threat for them doing this too. It's not like, you're right. That's interesting because you have to look at the competitive dynamics too, which I hadn't thought about, which is Costco is really not in curbside that all that much. Right. And so you, you not offering, it doesn't put you at a competitive disadvantage. I'm curious. And what do you think though? You're, you're kind of the, you're, well, you hate warehouse club shopping, exactly. but um, what do you think about this? Okay. So I think that while I hated this idea to begin with, and I was in Truett's camp and I said like, no, I don't like this from a customer awesome perspective. Discussion. Yeah. I, think that it's really smart for Sam's Club to do this. I think okay. that you get to test and see what the propensity is for people like me who hate going into the experience are willing to pay. Like yeah. you asked me the question we were sitting in Europe and you're mm -hmm. like, would you, even though it's different Target and Sam's Club, mm -hmm would you pay for target curbside service? And I said, absolutely. Yes. I would, if it was, if it was only the difference of what is it like five more dollars a month and I can have curbside pickup for the entire year, I can simplify my shopping experience. Yeah. I absolutely would pay for that. And so I think they're going to be able wow. to see okay. what the value is of that, of that membership that they're having a difficult time getting people to get on. Um, and I think that, you know, all in all, when all said and done, I think that they're going to see more traffic to the stores because the people that aren't using curbside pickup right now are just going to keep their membership. They're going to go in stores. And I think then ultimately you see a sales lift in store of, you know, people going back, like Chad's saying, going back into the stores, shopping in a club experience where they end up picking up, you know, five or six yeah. more items than they planned on going in with. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think net net then, I mean, I, I think you guys, I think, I think I kind of like this then. Yeah. You guys are bringing up some good points. The competitive dynamic thing is interesting. The competitive and the other part too is Walmart's in this conversation as well. Walmart has Walmart Plus, mm -hmm. which they're still trying to exploit. And so if they run an experiment and Sam's Club, we have to keep this in mind too. Sam's Club is one of the best retailers around yep. over the last, you know, five to six years. They they have done a great job, especially innovating. So, like, you know, to me, you're bringing up a good point because if it doesn't work, then simply put it back. Mm -hmm. But if it does work, then you've got something that you can benchmark and leverage for potentially Walmart plus down the line. Like if you want to say, Hey, you want curbside pickup, that's fine. Get, get in our plus program. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do it for free anymore. That's interesting. That, that puts me over the edge on yeah. this in terms of supporting it, which yeah, no, I had no idea going into it. Cause if you even look at the economics of it, 50 bucks, that's and $4 an order, that's 12 orders you're placing a year to make the value jump that high. So it looks like they're thinking actually that people are, they're trying to push people more in store right. in general than actually trying to push the, the upgrade of the membership. So I don't know, Chua, do I, I, do we can, do we convince you too, or where's your head on this still? Last word. Um, those were convincing arguments. Um, I'm pretty <laughs> hard, so. um, I, 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 but look, the, I think the point is well taken in terms of, these are important. these are tests you can run. Um, they've already they will have already run this test multiple times. They saw saw the impact. You can you can believe that. Um, and uh, and so I guess we'll see. Uh, I, I didn't think about the in store point of of driving traffic there. 
Yeah, they, and they, the point that you're bringing up though is great though, because yeah, anytime you're causing friction, you got to be really damn sure this is the right move, which is why I'm still like hedging my bet. I'm like, I'm like 60 40 on my current position, which will probably change by next well, week's show. And we and know, will point it out to me too. And we know from experience though, too, that Sam's Club can turn something around like this in a very short amount of time. If they see the data that this is not working, it's causing the friction that Truett's talking about. Yeah. You know, they created concierge shopping in six weeks. We'll see a re response from Sam's Club quickly. And that's what I love about retail is people think that we're beholden to these decisions. We're not. You can mm -hmm. change them anytime you want, as long as the customers will stick with you, which is right. the key point. Okay. We're going to go right. to headline number five. All right. Let's roll. Let's keep going, Ann. I cannot believe we're bringing this back up again. Chris keep we're going to keep you down to like a level five throughout this conversation but headline number five according to an amazon press release starting later this year amazon customers living in lockford california will become the first to receive prime air deliveries via drone that's right so this is how it works so Ooh, once boy. onboarded customers in lockford will see prime air eligible items on amazon they place the, the order on Amazon as they normally would, and they receive an estimated arrival time with a status tracker for their order. So pizza delivery, Domino's delivery tracker, but for your Amazon Prime delivery. Uh, the drone will fly to the des designated delivery location, descend to the customer's backyard, which note has to be in the customer's backyard. Yes. Hover at a safe, safe height, and it will then safely release the package and rides back up to altitude. The press release noted that Amazon's drones were 10 years in the making and are different from other drone delivery vehicles because of their, quote, industry leading sense and avoid system that will enable operations without visual observers and allow our drone to operate at greater distances while safely and reliably avoiding other aircraft, people, pets and obstacles. End quote. I love that pets is in that quote. Uh, <laughs> yes, pets. Well, that's a real thing. Let's right. be honest. Got to watch out for fun, um, guys. The listeners have heard how we feel about these from the Walmart announcement. So we're going to take, we, we got to, we got to get your opinion as uh, consultants, you know, is this different than our rants on Walmart because it's Amazon Chad, let's go to you first. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, your your couple rants on this are are historic uh, in in multi ways, which um, you know is, is impressive. But you know, I I'm trying to look at this differently because okay. Amazon's name is attached to it. But, but okay, how is it really right? Like, so break down the components of it. So granted, it's free versus the delivery fee Walmart imposed. So you don't Great have point. to, yep. you don't have to pay for the privilege of seeing your package precariously dropped from above. Right. Um, but looking at the drone photos and there were a few of them, the weight limits are probably similar. Mm -hmm. So it's still one-to-one -one delivery, limited mm -hmm. product carrying capabilities. Uh, you know, all of this uh, avoidance technology and everything like that. So it doesn't run into my chimney, my power line, my pet, yeah. another one of these in the air. Like that's good. So like, I guess it didn't directly say whether it was human controlled with pilots and all of that, but so that might be a signal, but it did say that they were still working on FAA permission, which right. I thought was funny. Like that's kind of essential. I mean, they'll get it, but, but still. So I don't know, long-term, maybe, maybe there's like some cost benefit here, um, you know, environmental benefit, I suppose, of reduced carbon footprint of delivery vehicles. But I mean, look at the barriers to overcome here. Right. Yeah. Legally, safety-wise, like public nuisance, right? Like if mm -hmm. I don't opt in, but my neighbor does, I still have drones flying all over my neighborhood, right? Like. I, do the your benefits... neighbor, your neighbor might think it's like a government drone or something. You never know who your neighborhood. Yeah. Like, yeah. And my next door neighbor and my, right. like we compete for number of Amazon packages delivered during a week. Right. Like I just don't think the benefits outweigh the barriers over time. So I'm, I, you know, I I'm with you that this falls into a similar kind of, you know, Walmart drone argument. So yeah. it's a PR it's a PR gloss basically at this point. Yeah. And what do you think though? Cause you were in Europe when this came out, you were kind of like liking this a little bit more. Are you with Chad though? Oh no, I'm, you, you I'm are. not okay. liking this. You're still in the rant the, camp. The only thing that I think is somewhat redeeming about this for me and where I would judge this differently for Amazon is they've been doing this for 10 years. So they're still working on perfecting this and making right. it a viable option right. after 10 years. And 
based on my understanding, it does not require a pilot to operate. So they're leveraging their proprietary technology right. that they talked about instead of require so that, you know, anyone who doesn't have a pilot's license can operate these drones, which I think makes it more feasible as a, as an option, but I still don't agree, but, uh, true it. What about you? What are, where are you, where do you fall in this camp? Yeah. Um, Amazon's proven us wrong time and time again, but I also challenge uh, to see where this leads. Also, just from a standpoint of, um, I mean, and they, they, they aren't thinking within a year, right? They're thinking uh, 10 to 20 years ahead, but how much, you know, what's the purpose is besides novelty, right? I mean, do they really need to compress shipping times that much further beyond what they're doing, continuing to build out their logistics network? Um, from a cost standpoint, you know, autonomous vehicles and taking out the labor of drivers seems like that would have probably significantly more impact than, than drones. You're limited in terms of what you can deliver as well. Lots of safety, safety and regulatory concerns. So it feels like it's more novel than it's going to have any impact for any of any kind of the foreseeable future. And um, it'll be interesting to see on the sidelines <laughs> what they do. Yeah. Chris, your last word. You want word. me to have the final word yeah. here? No, I'm, I'm, I think we all resolutely agree on this one. I mean, I think this is just PR keeping up with the Joneses. Walmart released it. They tried, Chad, I thought you brought up some good points too, how they were like positioning it on the price, which, you know, is just going head to head on the marketing with their brand and why it's a good option. Just trying to reinforce the messages they typically do. But, and, you know, the last point I would make, yeah, we were in Amsterdam this week and holy Hannah, there are a lot of bicycles there. Yeah. And it got me thinking, like, if we ever had drones delivering packages to that same degree, do you know how many gall darn drones there'd be in the sky? And that's not a world I think anyone wants to live in, especially when you start thinking about, like, it's just a better option to have one-to-many delivery with electronic delivery vehicles. Yeah. Like, so I just don't see this going anywhere. And anyone that thinks it does on social media, honestly, I think you're deluding yourself. I can't say it any other way. You're just absolutely deluding yourself. But who knows? Maybe I'll be wrong 20 years out. But you're right. It's going to be 20 to 30 years out before this is anything. But anyway, let's go to the lightning round. All right. Sounds good. Uh, True. We're going to start with you. Hudson News just opened an autonomous airport store utilizing Amazon's one palm payment at the Nashville airport. What are your go to airport snacks? So my go to snacks are sparkling water. And in preference, it's Topo Chico. uh, Oh, yeah. And then if I have to do Perrier, I will. For some reason, LaGuardia <laughs> Airport has no sparkling water. Oh no. It is oh, a, wow. they, they, how many billions of dollars do they spend uh, on the airport and they don't have the assortment. And then the second thing is Belvedas. I don't know if y'all eat these. I eat these probably like twice a day. Oh my God, really? Cookie. So I have literally dozens of packages of Belvedas that come like once a month and uh, <laughs> the chocolate cream form of it if I can find it. Oh my God. Now I got to oh, I didn't try know they those. had a chocolate cream form. I just know them as the cardboard form. You can, you can tell the truth down in Texas too, because we only have Perrier. I feel like at most of the airports, we have to settle. No, so uh, Topo Chico hasn't made its way up here yet. Right. Like it no, does in the God, South. no. All right, Chad. Question number two, Mark Laurie's food delivery startup wonder just raised $350 million in a series B, which is absolutely insane to me which valued the company at $3.5 billion. As much as I'd like to talk about that, my question for you is, what's the last thing you ordered from a food truck? I don't know what the last thing I ordered was, but definitely my best food truck experience. Um, Austin, Texas, 2 a.m., taco truck, sitting on the curb, then watched Kevin Durant walk down the street all by himself. Whoa. Wow. All right. Did you offer him a taco? I did not. Oh, next time. That's a hard food truck. Chad Chad doesn't share food. Chad doesn't doesn't share food. Especially at 2 a.m. on the curb. (laughs) Right. Um, All right. The uh, true it, the new Xbox TV app will allow gamers to stream games on a Samsung smart TV without a console for the very first time. What, in your opinion, Truett, is the greatest video game of all time? So this is a pretty easy one. It has to be Call of Duty. <laughs> and um, it's, I played probably through business school six-ish hours a day. Oh like, my God. It, it ended up being really good. I had the headset. Oh. Uh, talked a lot of trash with you know younger kids, right? So <laughs> 
Uh, Full on forty year old virgin. Druid's Twitch, school, right? Druid's Twitch channel is yeah. very different than what you're hearing today right. on yeah. our podcast. Unfortunately, I've had to take a hiatus from it, but uh, we'd like to um, get back into it someday. Awesome. <laughs> nice. All right, last one, Chad, for you. Amazon launched virtual tryon for shoes last week. What shoe from your childhood do you most wish would be recreated for you today? I think it has been. So, okay. um, so I was a, the biggest Jordan fan growing up, um, but I only had a couple pairs that I remember. I think it was the the Air Jordan fours. Yeah, which that now the the retro four, yeah. like like the white with the red and the black yeah. little thing that comes mm-hmm. up. Those things were sweet. I was actually thinking about getting myself a pair, uh, <laughs> not that uh, not that long ago. So yeah, nice. do it. yeah, they're on the sneakers app all the time. Yeah, no, those things are bomb. I, I haven't, I don't have a pair of those. Yet. I need, no, but I you just pair. got your childhood. I did. I got the air sent- trainer once. Yeah. Thank you, Ann, for, I was, I was at Mayo and I couldn't sign up for them, but thank you, Ann, for doing that. You're and welcome. I haven't opened them yet. They should just deliver the box to me the today. Things Omnitalk you do fans. for the business. That's right. Chris. That's right. Keep you happy. All right. Well, that wraps us up today a big happy birthday to john cho joan van ark and roseanne's tv sister and ladybird's mom Lori metcalf mm-hmm. Yeah. And remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail blog in the business, make it OmniTalk. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news. And our twice weekly newsletter tells you the top five things you need to know each day and also features special content exclusive to us and just for you. And we try really hard to make it fit all within the preview pane of your inbox. You can sign up today at www.omnitalk.blog. Thanks, as always, for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Let's go to Chad. Chad, if people want to get in touch with you, learn more about a and what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, a couple of ways. You can visit our website, uh, alvarezandmarsal-crg.com. Uh, you can find us on our LinkedIn page, which is Alvarez and Marsal Consumer and Retail Group. And of course, you can find Truett or I directly on LinkedIn. Awesome. All right. And thanks to all you OmniTalk fans, as always, for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. And of course, on behalf of Chad, Truett, and Ann, be careful out there. The OmniTalk Fast Five is a Microsoft-sponsored podcast. Microsoft Cloud for Retail connects your customers, your people, and your data across the shopper journey, delivering personalized experiences and operational excellence. And is also brought to you in association with the A&M Consumer and Retail Group. The A&M Consumer and Retail Group is a management consulting firm that tackles the most complex challenges and advances its clients, people, and communities toward their maximum potential. CRG brings the experience, tools, and operator-like pragmatism to help retailers and consumer products companies be on the right side of disruption. And Takeoff. Takeoff is transforming grocery by empowering grocers to thrive online. The key is micro-fulfillment, small robotic fulfillment centers that can be leveraged at a hyper-local scale. Takeoff also offers a robust software suite so that grocers can seamlessly integrate the robotic solution into their existing businesses. To learn more, visit takeoff.com. And Sezzle. Sezzle is an innovative buy now, pay later solution that allows shoppers to split purchases into four interest-free payments over six weeks. To learn more, visit sezzle.com.